I get it now about the game, which is the title of this audio. The spiritual game. The spiritual game, the spiritual goal, the spiritual life. In the beginning, when you're a spiritual baby, it's like being a regular baby. You don't have any ability to think at all in terms of spirituality. Everything you hear, you repeat. You have no idea what you're repeating means. God loves me. Jesus loves me. I'm saved. Yeah, you can repeat that. But you don't know what it means. You're basically, the rest of your life, spiritually, is spent learning what it means. And you basically go full circle from spiritual babyhood to total spiritual weakness just like Christ was on the cross. That's where you're at. It's full circle. You're using basic ideas at the beginning of your spiritual life. And after you learn it all, you still go back to the basics at the end. At the full maturity, that's what you go back to. It's really ironic, and I didn't understand that for the longest time. I had to, you know, like work on and work on and think through, uh, you know, my pastor's 14, really 44 years of teaching on the subject before I got it okay you're going full circle just kind of like in physical life you start out a baby you're dependent you end up an old person and in diapers also that's kind of how the the spiritual life heads that's how it ended for my pastor too at the end he, he couldn't even talk he had Alzheimer's now that's really important to know because what we Christians think the spiritual life is, is not it at all. We think that, that if we learn and live on Bible, we'll become more competent and sin less, and we'll be somehow spiritual giants with always the right answers, always doing the right things, always obeying God, la di la That's not how it works at all. Paul tells you how it works. It's Romans 7. It's a constant zigzag. You're constantly failing. You're constantly succeeding. Your body doesn't want to obey what your soul learns about Bible. And it's as if you never learned the Bible. The more you learn the Bible, the more it seems to you as if you never learned it. Because you're not obeying what you know. You're just not. What basically changes, and the only thing that changes, is your thinking. The way you value life, the way you value people, the way you value things, how you look at life, what's important to you, all that changes. But your ability to execute your changed thinking is almost zero all the time. So it becomes progressively more frustrating to be alive. Your standards change to be like God's. Your thinking pattern changes to be like God's. You become extremely fluent in thinking in terms of Bible and you come to value that thinking more than life itself but can you live it out not at all now granted somewhere toward the end of your life you'll be much more what do you want to call it uh, competent and your values will be higher and better and the sins that used to plague you as a spiritual baby won't bother you anymore but honey you get new and different sins to replace them chief among the new and different sins are an extremely how do you want to call it you find it extremely excruciating to just get through a day because everything is so substandard compared to how you think you're substandard, everything around you is substandard, everybody you know is substandard. So it's a lot more frustrating to get through the day because you have much higher standards than you did when you started. Because they're God's standards. And you have to live with them not being met. That's the chief test of the spiritual life is to have all these high standards and really believe in them, just like Paul says in Romans 7. But you're not carrying it out. And that's why Paul writes Romans 8. He's explaining the differentiation. Sin nature can't obey. That's Romans 8, 1 through 10. The whole thought pattern is different. The, bre the, the, the body and the thinking of the human nature can't do it. 
Only the Holy Spirit can make it happen. So what ends up happening is that your life toward in maturity is extremely excruciating all the time. Even if you're living in Tahiti with the mint julep on the beach. With what any normal human would call the best life imaginable. You know, by human standards. We all think that being rich and in nice weather and with nice clothes and nice food and you don't have to work, that that's the ideal way to live. It really isn't. Anybody who lives that life for too long gets quickly bored. But you'll be even more bored because it, it's just like too small. And of course the hassles of life are magnified in your mind because it's already too low a standard the nice stuff. So the low stuff is even worse. So it's like you're on the rack mentally all the time. The closest analogy I can think of would be like a parents who have to take care of a severely retarded child who's going to remain severely retarded all its life and is going to live for a long time. That's heartbreaking. It's, and it's full of hassle, of course. Because one of the problems that retarded children have, not all of them, but some, is they too are frustrated over their condition. And so they become bratty. And it's really hard to live with. It's hard on the child and it's hard on the on the parents. So it's kind of like that. Except that the people that you're living around, including yourself, don't consider themselves to be retarded. They think they're right. They think everything they're doing is good and, and right and just. So you don't even get to have the sort of empathy and sympathy you'd have with a truly retarded child who knows he's retarded. Instead, you're dealing with people who think they're adults, but they're bratty kids. And they're around you all the time, and you yourself don't seem to be just, you know, a bigger brat to yourself. Your own opinion of yourself just tanks. That's the real test of the spiritual life, is living with something that doesn't measure up to your standards. And Satan's big argument is, God, why did you do this to humans? You give, you, you expect them to live to your standards, and yet they can't. This is unfair. This is Satan's big argument. This is why Satan was, that's why those three temptations in Matthew 4 are worded the way they are. Satan's basically accusing Christ of not using his deity to help himself and mankind. And therefore God is not loving. And that's why Satan's tempting Christ with good deeds. All the three temptations in Matthew 4 are good deeds. They are not temptations to sin. The sin would be if Christ did the good deeds, using his deity to do it. Okay? So the first temptation was feed. The second temptation was do something flashy to make people believe in you. And the third temptation was, you know, do politics. Well, Christians always do all those three temptations. They're caving in to Satan's temptations all the time. Christ didn't. Christ chose to be weak instead. And that's the test of the spiritual life. Once you know, and it takes years to get to the no phase. I mean, you know, for me, I want to say it took me 20 years. And then the last 20 years, I've been shocked about knowing. Because the knowing is harder than not knowing. So it takes years to get to the no phase. It took Paul, um, my pastor was guessing, you know, maybe uh, 14, 30, about 30 years, because he converted in 30 AD. He reached spiritual maturity by 68 AD. So 38, 38 years from birth, from spiritual birth to maximum spiritual maturity for Paul, who was already versed in the Mosaic Law. Okay, so it takes a long time. All right, but just like in human maturity, it ought to take, if you're really learning and living on Bible every day, it ought to take 20 years to get to adulthood, spiritual adulthood. And then the rest of it's a real battle, baby, on the inside. Because you're always living with everything being lower than your standards. And you never measure up, not yourself and not anybody else. And do you keep going or do you quit? And settle for some substitute or just stop believing in God? because of the extreme tension 
between the high standard and the low self. And that's Satan's argument, is that God made it unfair. That God should lower his standards, should give the little human good deeds to do so they can be pleased with themselves, instead of feeling like dog doo-doo all the time. And that's basically what he's saying to Christ in Matthew 4. That's what he said in the Job arguments. Hi, in order for Job to want you, you had to bribe him with goodies. And Satan's tempting Christ to actually bribe the world with goodies in Matthew 4. So that's the range. And and frankly, at the high end, I'm not finished yet, but I, I know what lies ahead. At the high end, you get into an intimacy with God in your thoughts. It's a total pie to do. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it worked for Christ. Total oneness, which is what he had and prayed for in John 17. Total oneness of thinking. Total shared thinking. Which essentially means shared standards and then a shared fluency of how to apply those standards. Always failing, of course. But at least you know what the right answers are. And you come to fall in love with them. It's not doing the right thing because you ought to. It's not doing the right thing to have a good opinion of yourself. You actually fall in love with righteousness because God is. That's the big surprise about him which, which, you know, chaps me every day. He's totally in love with righteousness. And, honey, he created it. There's no such thing as righteousness that God didn't create. There's no such thing as anything that God didn't create. So Satan's big argument is, Hi, God, your definition of righteousness is arbitrary. And I'm going through that in episode in episode 11 now of the Sad Strat video series. Satan's strategy. I'm trying to cover how God's absoluteness looks like it's arbitrary, and you have to argue that it is. He just flat defines what truth is. He just flat defines what righteousness is. And then he just flat defines that he loves it. And he gives us all to it, and he pours himself out for it. By his own definition, everything's completely self-defined. God defined the whole thing. We wouldn't know what righteousness was because God defined it. So the argument in the trial is, is God's definition of everything more worthwhile, worth dying for, even if you get nothing for it, than Satan's definition of stuff, which is entirely based on good deeds, which is entirely based on tit for tat, I do for you, you do for me, relative good, if, you know... Everything that the world holds dear, that's Satan's standard right there. So you already know what Satan's standard is. You just walk, just turn on television any moment in time. That's Satan's standard playing out. Just have a conversation with anybody at any time. Or just think a thought yourself. That's Satan's standard playing out. And it is not God's standard. So when you get to the point where your thinking is fully developed... So you too fall in love with the righteousness. It gets totally excruciating to breathe. Because nothing meets that standard down here. And you never meet it. You're lucky and blessed and totally relieved if the Holy Spirit, who indwells you and empowers you between sins, managed to get you to like 50% of the righteousness goal for any activity you get you engaged into for 60 seconds. That's a miracle if you even get that far. And you're relieved. You're doing what you're doing, not, you know, for righteousness sake. Practicing righteousness, like John says in 1 John. But you're doing it to get relief. It's the only thing that makes you happy in the final stage of spiritual life. No matter what you get or what you lose, nothing else makes you happy than just aiming at the righteousness for its own sake. Whether you get anything out of it or not, whether you accomplish anything out of it or not, whether it works or not, whether you fail or not, just because you try. That's the only satisfaction there is in life. Well, but that's the satisfaction that God gets. And so the thing about death is that death becomes this great relief. You long for it. Just like Christ said, he longed for the cross. Because you want to be tapped out. And after death, well, you know, there's no sin then. So then you'll finally be able to practice righteousness 
at God's standards and be competent at it all the time. And that's what you live for, dying. That's what Paul says, Philippians 1.21, I think it is. Living Christ, dying prophet is the actual Greek, and he's shouting. Yeah, that's why. So this is where it leads, baby. In the beginning, it's all about ego, and I'm insecure, and I'm mouthing words, and God is this smiley person, and I'm supposed to be nice if I'm a Christian, and all that stuff is claptrap. And somewhere along the way, you find out that 90% of what you were taught is absolutely wrong. And you're tempted to think that the Bible is wrong and God doesn't exist and all that other stuff when you go through the inevitable denouement of finding out that you've been lied to. Because you have. I mean, not deliberately. People, you know, a person get, can lie to you and think he's telling the truth. And that's basically what happens in Christianity. And then it's a question, well, do you still try to believe in God anyway? Do you revisit the whole question of what you were taught versus what the Bible actually says? Because you want to know God. And if you make the decision, yes, to do that, you're going to be very happy in the end. But you're also going to be hurting most of the time. Because your standards change, your thinking changes. You could give me a billion dollars right now, that wouldn't do... All I think about is, okay, now what am I supposed to do, Dad? It would be a burden. You could take away all my obligations and all the things I dislike in this life and substitute them with everything I like and I wouldn't be happy. My pastor said this for years but I didn't understand what he meant. And what he meant was the only thing that will make you happy really, from childhood on the only thing that makes you happy is when you learn to practice righteousness. Which you can't do until you know what it is, and you can't know that until you've been learning and living on Bible every day for, I don't know, at least 10 years. That's when it starts to gel. And by about 20 years, you really have a clear idea of it. And at that point, you might want to quit. Because it'll be so overwhelming. But what gets you keeping on going is, your God, I'm not, that's all I know. I still want to know you, Dad. I still want to know my Lord God. And then your thinking really starts to be like Christ. In the final phase, you're totally occupied with Him. And life is just a horror story every day, even when it's nice. Because the standards aren't met. And then you really start to appreciate the cross and how hard it was to go there. You appreciate why Christ left so often to go off by Himself and just get away from everybody. And why he talked the way he did to people. I've told you this over and over and you still don't get it? How many times have I told you? How many times does he talk like that? And you can hear the practical cheer, tears in his voice. When he's trying to explain things for the umpteenth time. And the apostles, who, people who became the apostles, still didn't understand him. That's how it's going to be for us too. When we get in this final phase, and uh, some more less than 1% of Christians even enter that last phase, let alone complete it. We know that at least eight persons since Christ have, have done that. Because time wouldn't continue if they didn't. That's a criterion for buying time. You have to be super mature. Paul, of course, was one of them. And 490 years after Paul, there was somebody else. And 490 years after that, there was somebody else. And then we get to here, and our 490 ends in uh, 2130. I think it's 2130. So maybe you'll be the guy who completes the 490 that ends in 2130. Or maybe it's already been done. But at least eight people made it. So that's not too many. Maybe you'll be one of them. But this is where it leads, and I'm sorry that I still ended up going over 20 minutes, but I hope I gave you a good sense of the sort of angst and the, the major problem of spiritual growth that gets experienced. Now at the positive end, as I hope I conveyed, the intimacy with God is total. And nothing else will make you happy than that too. That's why the only thing that makes you happy in terms of your life, your relationship to life, is to practice righteousness no matter what happens. 
Even if you fail, and you always do. Even if everybody else fails, and they always do. Standards never met. So it's Philippians 3.14. It's plodding in Greek like you're marching in mud. Katas, kopon, dioko, ais, to, brabeo, te, sano, klesius, tu, te, u, and Christo, Jesu. Okay? And that's Philippians 3.14. You can read it in English. Onward to the goal, I press. To the upward call in Christ Jesus is the best way I could, you know, imitate the tone of the Greek. It's a plotting. It's Hamburger Hill in your mind. And you, you could be sitting on the beach having, you know, your servants do all your work for you. And you're not happier for that. You could be in a foxhole with the rain coming down and your feet molding because they're wet all the time and you're miserable in the body but you're still happy in the soul because you know him and that's the point God's uniting heaven and hell together in this set of standards with the low lifestyle tapenose that's in Philippians uh, 2, 5 and uh, through 10. The whole letter of Philippians is about the Hilo united and how it reproduces. Greek verb is megaluno, it's in Philippians 1.20, usually translated magnify, is used in the Magnificat the same way, but it means it means to exalt by reproducing. That's why it's so funny when Mary used it. Now Paul says, I will exalt Christ in my body. Reproduce is what he's talking about. See, because in the ancient world, you exalted the parents by reproducing kids. You, you exalted your husband as a wife by reproducing lots of kids. That's the kind of exalting that it means. Christ in you, the confidence of glory, Holy Spirit just threw that in my mind. Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Idea of reproduction, Galatians 4, 19. Christ in you, Christ being reproduced in you, his thinking pattern in you. There's nothing to beat that. There's nothing more heavenly and enjoyable and fulfilling. There's also nothing more painful. Preview of coming attractions. Peace out.